Good morning, everyone. Today, we have a special guest speaker. He is our first candidate for filling the pulpit, and he comes from us from Apex Baptist Church down in North Carolina. So I'd like you all to please welcome to the pulpit, Jared Wiedenroth. Thanks, Matt. Hey, good morning, church. It's been about nine months since we've last been here, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, and you were preparing for your kids' camp at that time, and I remember um, there was all the decorations around the church, and it was cool, cool to hear that you had a great response in that of 20-plus kids from the community, and uh, commend you on that. Grateful that God provided uh, those kids to be here and just the awesome week that you must have had. Um, so just a quick life update. Uh, we have four kids. Um, our daughter Kaya has turned 12 and is now in sixth grade. And so you can imagine all the things that come with a teenager um, and all the things that us as parents are going through with her. But she's awesome. Uh, it's almost like having a third parent in the house. And um, yeah, so she's great. Our daughter Chloe, she's 10. She's into artsy things, uh, really quiet, good spirit about her. Uh, she's a doll, and we just love her. Um, Jameson, he's our, I wouldn't say wild card, but he's our wild boy. Um, he's eight, and he loves to be outside in nature, digging and finding whatever kind of creatures that he can. Um, he's even tagged a lizard in the last week and just trying to keep track of that lizard in our backyard. So that's kind of wild. Um, then we have our youngest, Lincoln. He's six, and he's into all things sports. So right now it's football. Um, so he's in flag football and just loving life. He is a, a, a cute little boy that we get to raise. So um, life is busy. Life is fun. Um, but we get to do that, and it's um, God, God has just given us an awesome family to, to provide for. So uh, just a quick life update, and I commend my wife on a lot of things, and she'll probably not like that I call her out on this, but she holds the, everything together at home, homeschooling the four kids and just keeping everything maintained, and I just want to give her props for all that. So um, today, before we dive into God's Word, just like to open up in prayer and um, just let him take control of today. Father, we thank you for this time that we can uh, just come and open your word, God, and dive in to see what you have for us today. I pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear your word. I pray that you would speak through me today and that these would be your words uh, spoken. Lord, I think of all the things in our world that are gone awry, awry and just gone crazy. And God, I think about the, the war, um, both in the Ukraine and Israel and Gaza and with, with Iran. Um, God, I just pray that you would um, be known through all of these situations that we hear about that are happening, where people are hopeless, that they would look to a Savior and find you. God, I pray for our own country in the same prayer where people feel hopeless, they feel lost, and I pray that they would come to know you as their Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray for Burlington, I pray for the surrounding area here in Massachusetts. I pray that uh, people would just have a desire to get to church, to know more about you, and find out who this King is. We call him Jesus, and in his name, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So today we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 8, and if you were here for Sunday school or the, the Bible study earlier, Mr. Ron did a great job of preaching my sermon ahead of my sermon today. So thank you, Mr. Ron, and um, we're going to dive into a cool story here and a cool time of Jesus' life, um, but before we dive into the Word, um, I've been doing some research lately, doing some research, and most surveys and research... Researchers say that the average adult asks about 25 to 40 questions a day. 25 to 40 questions. Not that bad. The average child asks about 200 to 400 questions a day. And most revolve around the word why. 
right? Us parents love to hear that. We collectively ask Google, as a people group, 3.5 billion questions or searches every single day. 3.5 billion Google searches every day. We are curious people. We want answers, and really we want them like fast, Amazon Prime fast. We want to know the answer now. And as parents of little kids, Lauren and I, we, we get asked a lot of questions. I think we're at the peak of that 400 um, each day from our kids. Some very early in the morning when that first cup of coffee has not set in yet, and, and we look over each other, and like those hazy eyes just meet one another, and just, what, what just happened? What just got asked, right? And then we get some at the most random times of the day. And I think about a 12 and a half hour car ride, how many questions we got. <laughs> and the most frequent was, how much more time? Are we there yet? You know, we've kind of just started saying, we have four more hours instead of saying, hey, we have this many minutes because the minutes seem so much longer to them. It's so much bigger of a number. So those car rides are definitely tough, but they bring out some good conversations for the kids. Topics, they vary in complexity, and sometimes that the complexity of those conversations and those questions are super high, and it amazes our, mi our, our minds about how complex and sophisticated our kids' minds are. And then there are some times where the questions are so simple, so basic, and it's, it's maybe those questions and those times where we say, man, that question seems so simple, but yet it's so profound. It's so profound. Why is this even being asked? You know, Jesus himself in the four Gospels is recorded asking 307 questions. He asks 307 questions. Some of those questions are very profound. Some of them are very challenging to individuals and make them uncomfortable. And some seemed so basic that it was questioned, why is this question even being asked? Why is he even asking this question? Well, as we journey into Luke's gospel, we see one specific question arise here. This question to us today may seem super basic. One of the most basic questions that we all could have answered. But as we read this text together, we, we kind of see the importance of this question because it, it really highlights, it highlights the faith that is displayed by two very different people. It highlights the faith that is displayed by two very different people. Ones whose status, his wealth and his pocket had him on a, on a pedestal above all the other people in the area. And the other, an unnamed woman who has been an outcast, who is as poor as poor can get who was withdrawn from society and had probably been in a helpless, hopeless state for quite some time. This faith that is shared between these two can, can really open our eyes today, open our hearts today to a big, big question. What do you put your faith in? Better yet, who do you put your faith in? Who do you put your faith in? Before we get to the text, uh, I want you to consider a few kind of minor questions. And no need to answer out loud today. You can jot these answers down and maybe reflect on them in another time. But the question is this. Ha have you ever been in a place in your life when you've asked, is having faith worth it? Is having faith worth it? Why or why not? When was that? And how'd it go? Another question. Have you ever been in a place in your life where faith has put you in one of two places? First, a place where you've felt so helplessly lost, distant and questioning God, questioning Him entirely. Or the opposite, the second place. Your faith has been so strong where you have been so close to Jesus your relationship with God has been on another level way better than ever before. Maybe you're in a place today 
where you are leaning to one side or the other. Maybe you're feeling helplessly lost. Or maybe you're holding on strong. Wherever you are today, let's look at God's word today. Let's look at it and glean off of the life of Jesus and how he is where our faith needs to be. So the text, I'll, I'll kind of set it up for you. The setting is this. Jesus had just been in a Gentile region of the Decapolis. It's a community of ten cities. It's a community of ten cities who operated autonomously, but yet still dependent on the Roman Empire. They were dependent on the Roman Empire, but they, they were autonomous in their city structure. It's there where Jesus had commanded demons to leave a man. To leave a man, and, and he cast them into pigs on the side of a mountain. Those pigs then ran off, as we know, off a cliff and drowned. Right? The people in this region, they weren't pleased with Jesus, to say the least. They weren't pleased. Here's a man walking around pulling demons out of somebody. That's probably an awkward look at this time. And then he kills all their livestock. Not, not happy, right? So, probably not a good look for Jesus in this area. And these people politely say, no, thank you. No, thanks. Can you please leave? Can you please leave? Even after seeing the miracle of pulling a demon out of somebody. So, what did Jesus do? He got in a boat and he set sail. And that's where we're going to pick up in verse 40. Verse 40, Luke 8, verse 40. And if you're willing and able, will you stand for the reading of God's word today? Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler, underline that word ruler, of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, and here it is, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. Je but Jesus said, Someone touch me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in, this, in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well go in peace while he was still speaking someone from the ruler's house came and said your daughter is dead do not trouble the teacher anymore but jesus on hearing this answered him do not fear only believe and she will be well and when he came to the house he allowed no one to enter with him except peter and john and james and the father and the mother of the child and all were weeping and mourning for her but he said do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. Here we have a lot to unpack. A lot just happened in this brief moment of Jesus' life here. First off, we see that Jesus was welcomed. Jesus was welcomed. His arrival was anticipated. I think it's important for us to know that Jesus was welcomed in this specific area, which was believed to be Capernaum, especially since he was just run out of the group of cities, right? Luke makes it clear that people were waiting for him. People were waiting for Jesus. And I can, I can see it now. They're on the banks of the shore 
looking out. Is that the boat? Is he, maybe he's on that one. Is that, could that be Jesus? They were waiting for him patiently, eager to find Jesus, to see him again. Then the way Luke writes it, we see a quick introduction of a man. And not just any ordinary man. A Jewish ruler of the synagogue. Not a rabbi, not a teacher, but one who was entrenched in his Jewish faith. He was entrenched in his Jewish faith. His role would, it would have been that of a modern day director of operations within the church. A lot of larger churches that we see, we have one at our church down in Apex, a director of operations. They see it, everything that has to be organized within the church, from whoever the rabbi was going to be that was teaching on a specific day, to making sure that service times were appropriate. Um, This man's job was super important within the synagogue. He had a lot of weight on his shoulders, making sure that everything in the synagogue was taken care of. And he would have held the same convictions that his friends, his, the rulers of the Jewish area of this time, he would have held the same convictions that this Jesus that everyone's waiting for, everyone's pursuing, he speaks blasphemy. He would have held those same convictions. He does not hold the same rituals as we do. But what does he do? What do we see here? Here he comes, this Jewish leader, deep in his Jewish faith, deep in his Jewish traditions, falls to his knees at the feet of Jesus. An ultimate sign of respect. That was not supposed to happen. That was not supposed to happen. This Jewish man would have been one of the last people to fall at the feet of Jesus. And take a picture of that for a second. Picture that in your mind. This Jewish man falling to the feet of Jesus. What a beautiful picture. Next, we see that he asks that Jesus comes quick. If you're a King James fan, your version of Scripture reads, He fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. That word besought or implore is an urgent request. An urgent request, fervently asking someone to do something. The Christian Standard Bible, the CSB version, uses the word pleaded. This was something important. This was important. Please, my one and only daughter... My one and only daughter, she's ill. Please come quick, for you can heal her. Jairus' only daughter, about 12 years of age, is dying. And in a last-ditch effort to save his precious girl at the feet of Jesus. We don't know if this man had been praying, fasting, asking God for a miracle. We don't know if he asked the rabbis of his synagogue to come and pray over his child. We don't know any of that. We don't know if the illness came on all of a sudden. We don't know if it had been a long-lasting illness. All we know is that this, this desperate father was quick to jump out of his Orthodox Jewish faith and fall at the feet of the one the only one who could save his daughter. He produced and exercised faith in Jesus. He produced and exercised faith in Jesus. Dr. Tony Evans says that his story, meaning Jairus, is a reminder that when we encounter desperate circumstances, they can cause us to exercise a desperate faith. You may be saying today, but Jared, you don't know what I'm going through, man. Faith in Jesus? Jared, you don't know the battle I face every day just to get out of bed. 
Jared, you don't know the pain I'm in about that divorce, the loss of a loved one, that breakup, not getting into the college of my dreams, the layoff that just hit my company. Look around us. The world has gone mad. And we want to talk about faith today? Well, yes, yes I do want to talk about faith today. As some of you know, when I was in college, way back in 2006, I received a phone call uh, one night from my brother, and he let me know that my good, good friend, Aaron Cooper, was missing. I said, missing? What do you mean, missing? He said, well, he was rafting, and his raft tipped over, and Aaron never came back up. And five days later, they found Aaron's body about a mile down the river. This only son of the family, gone. God, what is going on here? This only son, his sisters, don't have a brother anymore. Such an amazing kid. How could you... How could you let this happen? How should I handle this? God? Skip ahead three months. I received an unusual call during a night class of mine. And it was my friend Mike who was calling me. And he never called me. So it was very rare. So I declined the call. thought school was important. But Mike called back, and I was like, wow, okay, this must be important. So I excused myself from class and took the call. Mike said, hey, are you sitting down? I said, no, I'm good. Strong, I can stand up. He said, no, I think you should sit down. And Mike informed me that my very best friend, that some of you even know, his name was Jared Raymond, was killed in Iraq. To say my world was rocked, is an understatement. God, what are you doing? Are you even real? I thought. God, my two best friends, gone way too early. My faith in this time was rocky. It was stagnant, if at all visible. I'll be honest. I didn't feel close to God at all. And to think of having a relationship, a friendship with Jesus, wasn't even on my radar. Thankfully, through God's providence and grace, he didn't let my faith in him go too far. Today I stand in front of you in an unlikely position in my mind as a pastor who relies on God's word. And someone who is ever ready to fall at the feet of Jesus. Desperate circumstances. Desperate faith. I've been there. I think about our son Jameson as it relates to Jairus a little bit. Now Jameson's not a Jewish uh, ruler by any means. But he's going through something called vision therapy. And he needs some correction of his eyes so that he can see things clearly, and so that he can read in a straight line across a page. And it turns out that there's a lot of kids that go undiagnosed with this. It's sometimes mistaken for dyslexia. But we found a doctor who can fix his vision, who can make it better, at least better than it was three months ago. He is, he is doing a lot better. We have faith in that doctor's ability to correct Jameson's vision. I think of Jairus. Jairus needed Jesus to correct his spiritual blindness. He needed more than traditional spiritual glasses, which almost made him more blind. He needed a spiritual awakening. His faith in Jesus opened his eyes to the true healer. So Jesus, in this moment, sees this man's faith, and is ready to go. He is ready to go. About a day's journey away, 
And as he makes his way, we see that people pressed in on him. Probably even tighter than it was before to make it notable by Luke. People are pressing in on Jesus. And I think about back when the Red Sox were good and the Patriots were good, you know, when we get, used to celebrate all downtown with the parades, millions of people downtown. I remember 2007 going to the World Series parade, and I got a front row seat right on the banister, right, right as the duck boats are about to pass, and I felt the masses of people behind me just pressing in just so they could get a look at the team, at the trophy, pressing in. I could feel that. Those were the days. But I could only imagine the days around Jesus pressing in on him to get closer and closer. And then a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, 12 years of utter misery, makes her way through this crowd, probably squeezing through people, bending, reaching. This woman who has spent all of her money, all of her resources on doctors, and this bleeding just won't stop. No one could heal her. Nobody. Society would have ostracized her. Her bleeding would have made her ceremonially unclean. Look at Leviticus 15, 25 through 27. Those, those were still in practice in this time by these Jewish people. Her bleeding would have made her an outcast. Even seeing her in public with the risk of touching her would have been a shock to people. But here she comes, stealthily trying to get to Jesus. Isn't it crazy, Mr. Ron, you touched on this earlier, but isn't it crazy to think that this woman had been bleeding for the same amount of time that this little girl, the sunshine of her parents' life, was living. Twelve years. The woman living on the outskirts of society, shunned and humiliated at her womanhood, humiliated at her condition. And then there's this little girl who is growing up in this wealthy Jewish home, privileged and without a care in the world. It's pretty fascinating that Jesus, he does not discriminate. He does not discriminate. And what does this woman do here? She comes from behind, bobbing and weaving, bobbing and weaving trying to get to Jesus, through the crowd. And some believe all she did was touch his outer garment, it says in Scripture. The outer garment. And in this time, the Jewish men would have worn a cloak on, their outskirt, on the outer part of their garments. It's this long cloak. And on the bottom of that cloak, on the corners, were these blue tassels. These tassels reminded these men to keep God's commandments. Jesus was most likely wearing one of these garments. So the tassel of Jesus' outer cloak, she reached for and touched it. And with that touch, with that faith, she is instantly healed. Instantly healed. The 12 years of bleeding stops. What a scene. What a relief for her. What faith. And what does Jesus say? Well, here's the question he asks. Very simple. Who was it that touched me? It's such a basic question, especially for the Son of God, who knows everything. But this question for us may look simple, but for the disciples... Even for this woman, for Jairus, may have been one of those perplexing simple questions. Peter, who often questioned Jesus, questions him here. We see that. There's a ton of people around you, man. Like, what do you mean who touched you? The crowd's pressing in on you. What do you mean who touched you? But Jesus 
knowing that the power had left him. Because Jesus, the Son of God, knows when someone is reaching out to him, still does know when someone is reaching out to him, wants this moment to matter. He wants this moment to matter. I think about this twofold. From this woman's perspective, uh uh-oh, I didn't expect him to say that. I didn't expect him to turn around. All I did was touch the outer garment. He probably didn't even feel it. But man, I'm so glad I'm healed. So happy. Then I think about Jairus. Yo, man, what are you what are you talking about? Who touched you? Like, my daughter is dying. We need to go. Come on. But Jesus, he wanted to acknowledge the faith of this woman. He wanted to acknowledge that. She falls down before him. It was me. It was me, and I am healed. This woman had a choice to make. She had a choice, run and hide and take the healing or take the healing and acknowledge Jesus. Go public with my faith. Go public with my testimony. And what does Jesus say? Daughter. The only time that we see Jesus address anyone in Scripture as daughter. Daughter. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Because your faith in me is authentic. It may have been a little shaky at times, but I will honor it anyway. It's genuine. It's bold. Your healing is complete. Go in peace. Shalom. And we see during this joyful, this joyful moment for this daughter of Jesus, a member of Jairus' household comes and announces that the little 12-year-old of the ruler is dead. Don't trouble the teacher, meaning Jesus, any longer. Don't trouble him any longer. You know what? Jesus obviously had other plans. Do not fear. Just believe. Just believe, and she will be well. Even in their unbelief, in the moments in this house, when Jesus tells them she is just sleeping, as they are laughing at him, Jesus shows his power, shows his promise. Jesus finished what he started. Even with a chance to heal somebody else on the way, he finished what he started. He committed and he healed. Jesus' work here, his his miracles provide deliverance. But beyond that deliverance is a mission. He's on mission. A mission to see others have faith and salvation through his grace and their belief. For us today, for us tomorrow... And in all circumstances in life, where is our faith? Where is our faith? Is it in the walk of our culture, in doing what they say is right? We know that's far off. Is it how they say we should live? Is it in faith in yourself, your own strength? Or is it faith in all circumstances in the Son of God? Are we willing to look at the questions Jesus asked to expose our faith? Or in times, the lack of faith we produce? Are we willing to dive deep on that? Are we willing to kneel before Jesus and say, the world is behind me. All I need is you, and you are all I need. 
Are we willing to battle through the crowds at our last ditch effort to reach out and touch the fringe, touch the tassel of his cloak to be eternally healed? Eternally healed. When the inventor of chloroform, Sir James Simpson, was dying, a friend said to him, you will soon be resting on his bosom. Simpson, he humbly replied, he said, I don't know as I can do that, but I think I have a hold of the hem of his garment. Maybe today you're here and you've already placed your faith in Jesus. But some days are just tougher than others. I get that. Maybe it's hard to wake up and see the light at the end of the tunnel. Just know Jesus is there. He is the light at the end of the tunnel. He's right in the middle of that tunnel, and he's right beside you, walking you through that tunnel. Do you have a hold of the hem of his garment? If you're here today and you're saying, Jared, I have never placed all of my faith in Jesus. Not like Jairus. Not like that woman. Faith saying, he is the Messiah. He is the true Son of God. The ultimate healer. The ultimate provider. The only one who can save me from my sins and, and save me from eternity of darkness and pain. But today, I need to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Like, like he is everything I have. He's everything of my life. I need that tassel to hold on to. Let's talk about that today. That faith will put you in a place for all of eternity, sitting next to Jesus, bowing before him. Paul affirms that in Romans 10.9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Don't let another day go by without putting your faith in the only one who can save you. Let's pray, and then we're going to listen to a song real quick. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and the healing that he provides to our souls, the eternity that we have when we place our faith in him. Thank you for the faith of Jairus. Thank you for the faith of that woman to step out and reach for Jesus, to bow at his feet. God, I pray that we would exemplify the same faith as we go about our week, each day, each moment, that we would be ready to bow at the feet of Jesus. The world behind us, and Jesus right before us. Father, we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.